Good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing Jennifer Turlio. Uh, Jennifer is a licensed certified athletic trainer, yoga instructor, and certified strength and conditioning specialist that has provided care for the adolescent athlete over the past 17 years in the public and independent school settings, as well as in her current private practice. She currently chairs the EATA Technology Committee, serves on the NAT NATA AT Compensation Task Force, and from 2012 to 2018, served as the chair for the New England Preparatory School Athletic Council Sports Medicine Advisory Committee. Jen has been a longtime advocate for mental health awareness, particularly in the adolescent athlete, which has reached a pinnacle in 2018 during her master's degree capstone research project. Along with her clinical and teaching experience, she's motivated to create collaboration among fellow athletic trainers. Good morning. I think it's morning. I'm from this little state way out uh, east, Connecticut, so I am a very long way from home. And I am beyond grateful to be here today. Um, I was actually slated to present a few years ago in 2020, and we all know what happened in 2020. So I am, again, beyond grateful to be invited to come back here and speak on a topic that I am super passionate about. Um, you know, anytime that someone comes up on stage and speaks, a lot of times there's kind of this underlying passion on why they're here. And like many of you, I, I'm, a, I'm a clinician. I'm boots on the ground. Um, I would not call myself a researcher or I'm not in academia. Um, and my background is in athletic training in the secondary school setting. Um, so I'm gonna speak with you guys today about how we can serve our athletes from a bit of a different perspective from mental health. And when I began uh, giving this presentation back in 2019, I can tell you that there was not a ton of research available in terms of adolescent athletes. Um, lots of information on elite athletes, a lot on collegiate athletes, but there was really a bit of a gap um, with our, our patient population. And again, things change. And over the past few years, I've been fortunate to have this discussion in a few different groups, and the information has also changed. So the information that I'm presenting to you this morning is similar to what I started back in 2019, but it has evolved just as our, our literature has evolved since then. So let's start with this. Take a deep breath. Everybody check in and take a deep breath. All right, I'm a little nervous. It's been a couple of years since I've done this. So take a deep breath, let's get centered, let's get in the present moment, and let's just check in for a moment. Think about what are our potential expectations? What might be our biases when it comes to mental health? Okay, we all bring different stories, we all bring in different um, experiences and perspectives. So I think it's really important when we have these kinds of discussions to kind of check in with what we're bringing to the table and just being open-minded, okay? So why mental health? Like many of you, again, I'm a clinician and I want to serve my patient population in the best way possible, okay? This young man um, came into the news in 2019 and he may be more of a familiar face out west as he is, was from Washington State University. When I began presenting on mental health on the East Coast, uh, this young man wasn't, wasn't as well known, but this is Tyler Holinsky. Are we familiar with Tyler Holinsky or his story? Okay, so uh, Tyler Holinsky um, was a quarterback at Washington State University, and in 2018, when I began my research, he took his own life, and for me, Besides having a personal or professional, excuse me, professional interest in advocacy, I have my own personal stake here. And I was stuck on this story. And I, I had to just keep reading about it. And why would a young man who is successful, he's in college, he's playing football, why, why would something like this happen? As a result, in his family's way of coping, and they were so wonderful when I began talking about Tyler, I spoke with the family, they sent me wristbands. They are truly passionate about bringing this information out to athletic trainers because we are sometimes the very first people who are gonna interact with our athletes. And, and we'll see as we go through these slides, a lot of times we're gonna be the first person that might pick up on a mental health concern. So they formed Holinsky's Hope 
as part of their coping mechanism. Okay? They formed this organization which you can easily Google. They have lots of things on social media. They have different challenges that you might have seen um, on Twitter and different athletic programs taking part to bring awareness about mental health in athletics. So I have no disclosures today. The only disclosure is, again, I did speak with the family. They know that I use Tyler's pictures. Um, and it's just helping to bring a bit of a face to a, a very prominent and um, serious concern in, in athletic training. <clears throat> so his family, they were completely floored by what happened to Tyler. And a lot of it is, well, where did this come from? They had no idea that he was dealing with any sort of mental health illness. And we see again in more recent stories through social media that we're seeing this stuff still happening and people are asking why, why is this happening? They seem successful, they're a great student, they're a great athlete, they're happy, they're healthy. And then we, we see things like this happening. His family, uh, again, formed the foundation in a way to cope. His teammates are all very involved in the program. So today's objectives, I have several. We're gonna talk about mental health literacy. We're gonna talk about what is unique to the adolescent athlete. And David Gallegos, Gallego, excuse me, shared with me that many of you are, are secondary school athletic trainers. Do you mind sharing who's in secondary school? Yeah, I love this. All right, so my majority of my background, I spent 14 years working um, in the secondary school setting. And even now in a private practice, a lot of my clients are high school athletes or they're playing club sports. What we're gonna also talk about today is talking about stigma, okay? There are several stigmas associated still with mental health help seeking. We're gonna look at some of the intervention programs, although we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that today. I have a few slides, you have access to my slides, um, but there are some intervention programs that we'll kind of brush over a little bit today. And then most importantly, how is we as athletic trainers, what is our role in, a, in a mental health and wellness in our athletes? <clears throat> This slide is everything to me. So this slide from NAMI gives this, this statistic of by age 14, a lot of mental health illnesses or conditions begin to show their onset about half, okay, by the age of 14. By the age of 24, so even if you're working in college, by age 24, a lot of mental health concerns will manifest, 75% will manifest by the age of 24, and we know through the literature that early intervention can help. So Tyler's story is, is unfortunately not as unique as we would believe it is. Depression can come on very early, early childhood into adolescence, and again in secondary school, that is our patient population. 20 to 30% of teenagers will experience at some point in their high school career a noteworthy depression uh, depression experience. And this here statistic, 6% of teens will go through an experience with suicidal ideation. And in this case, we need to be extra mindful about our patient populations who are identifying in the LGBTQIA community, uh, community because that percentage is, is very real. <clears throat> so let's talk sports. We are seeing over 8 million athletes that participate in athletics, particularly at that high school level, and that is related to the people that we see. So if we combine all of the different levels at the NCAA level, we take you know, D1, D2, D3, and we combine them all together, there are still way more adolescents that are participating in sports. We don't have any data from 2019 to 2021, at least that I could find on the National Federation of High School website. So we're relying still on that 2018, 2019 data, but there are a lot of athletes that are participating in sports. So why do we, why do we see that participation? Why do our athletes get involved in athletics? Well, we know as athletic trainers, there's a huge physical component, right? We have the physical benefits of cardiorespiratory endurance, building strength, our cognitive function is, is influenced by sports. We also see things like our social engagement. We learn how to work together. 
That is a huge skill set in a developing mind like we see in the adolescent athlete. They learn leadership skills, how to collaborate, how to build relationships. And then there's also this huge component of emotional benefits of participating in sports, building confidence, resilience. What happens when we lose? What happens if we get cut from a team? What happens if we make JV when we really wanted to make varsity? So we learn how to take all of these different situations, we can label them as stressors, but we take these situations and we have to adapt, okay? So there are so many positive benefits to participating in sports, including self-awareness. And for our female athletes, there's actually literature that shows that our female athletes have additional benefits from participating in sports because of the social components. <clears throat> All right, so good stress. We hear that word stress. We automatically have those negative connotations, right? Stress is bad. We want to mitigate stress. But we have to have some low level of stress in order to learn how to adapt in our life. So sports gives us plenty of really beneficial stress variables that can help us adapt, build resiliency, okay? Build coping mechanisms. Coping, mechanism, excuse me, coping mechanisms in the adolescent athlete is really important when we deal with particularly negative situations. How do we adapt and how do we move on? But looking at the, uh, the practice gap, we look at studies that really center upon our elite athletes, our higher athletes, but what is happening particularly in our younger athletes, our adolescent athletes? <clears throat> All right, so I love this graphic. I could not find who is responsible for creating this. But if you work with high school aged athletes, you might be able to look through and like, yeah, this makes 100% sense. All right, so just take a look, a moment and look through the average teenage brain. This is not scientific by any means. It's meant to be funny. But we have this sense of where do I fit in the world, okay? Relationships are huge. Okay. The ego, slamming and punching reflex right in the center, dealing with those heavy emotions, those big feelings, and knowing what to do with them. Okay. TV, awkwardness, memory for chores is like that little teeny speck right at the bottom. Okay. So our, <laughs> our athletics are coupled with the, the stresses of athletic performance, academic performance, college decision, physical development and the adolescent brain. Things are still changing and growing physically and emotionally in that adolescent brain. And this is a really big component too, is looking at positive, positive social relationships. Where do I fit in socially? My friend groups, how do I fit in with my classmates? How am I fitting in with my team, my family? Okay, another really big variable that sets our adolescents and athletes away from our older, um, older comparables. Come on, come on. There we go. Where do I fit in this whole life thing? There we go, all right, so we'll talk a little bit about more of the heavier stuff. So I didn't go through defining depression and anxiety. Um, I'm making an assumption that we all have a pretty decent get, uh, grasp on those things. But we can see the onset of depression arising from a few different things. Stressful life events, which you might see as an SLE. Injuries can be a stressful life event, we know this. Changes in the family, divorce, deaths, okay, terminal illnesses, having parents or grandparents who are ill. The romantic side of things, okay, the social sides of things, breakups, fighting with friends. These can all play a huge role in these stressful life events. But another thing that maybe we don't think about as much, we think about these big things, but chronic stress has now come up in the literature as something that we really need to look at as a source of, of a depression, something that can influence depression, because low levels of chronic stress over time can actually be really influential um, on the onset of depression. Let's consider some other things that also can play a role. So our individual responses to stress, what we bring to the table as individuals. History of depressive episodes, okay? If we have had a history 
of maybe a depressive episode, maybe we've sought treatment before, we're gonna have a higher likelihood to go down that path again. So knowing your athletes, knowing their medical history is so important as athletic trainers. Genetic disposition. There is a tie in genetics in terms of an athlete or an adolescent individual's likelihood of experiencing depression and anxiety. And the science shows us that the maternal side is actually where we can see that correlation. So making sure that our questions in our PPE or even just in conversations, knowing where's our students, where are our students coming from? Do we have a family history? stage of development, so we know early, early childhood through adolescence is that really key time that we can start to identify and see some of the onsets of mental health changes. Last but not least, gender. Our female uh, genders who are identifying as female have a higher likelihood of, uh, of showing signs of depression and anxiety. Could be because they're more apt to report, but again, literature is showing that our female identifying athletes um, are more likely to identify with depression and anxiety. All right, athletics and stress. Our athletes compared to non-athletes are going to, going to go through increased physical and psychological demands throughout their training and throughout their day to day. So we have our schooling, we have outside activities, we have clubs, we have honor roll, we have all the additional things they do in addition to their sports. So some other factors to consider for our adolescent athletes, injuries and concussions. We also know through the literature, and we're not gonna go too far down that road, but there's plenty of science um, that will support the correlation of injuries, concussion, and mood disturbances. The sport-related factors that we should consider, team conflicts, negative coach interactions, Playing to potential or expectation. So we started our talk off today is what are our expectations about this presentation? Well, our athletes are gonna have expectations. I think that I play at a particular level, why am I not starting? Or I have this expectation that I play better than my teammate, why do they have this spot and I don't? Okay. We're also seeing things like an a decrease in drive, okay? decrease in motivation, burnout. We know our athletes are playing multiple sports or maybe they're playing that same sport year round. Maybe they started playing soccer when they could start to walk and they have been playing soccer and here they are as a junior in high school and they're tired. They're just tired. So sports specialization also is really influential in our athletes and their perception of stress. We've got a great article in the Journal of Athletic Training Come on, there we go. About sports specialization, and about half of our athletes also play on club sports. So think about that for a second. Think about your athletes, and maybe you can pull into mind at least two or three athletes that might play basketball, but they're still playing soccer, or maybe they are a cheerleader, competitive cheerleader, and they're on the high school team, but they're also on the all-star team. So we have this sports specialization Choosing a main sport, this is how we quantify or qualify, excuse me, a three-point scale. Choosing a main sport, quitting other sports to focus our time on that one sport, and year-round training, so eight months or more that we're dedicating to that one sport. So what age is for early specialization? They're saying around 10, 11, 12 years old. But what I find interesting is we kind of look at the soccers and the basketballs and hockey and, and other sports, but we have exceptions to this rule, which I find really interesting. What about gymnastics, our aesthetic sports? So our gymnasts, our figure skaters, our dancers, they're saying that, but it's okay for these athletes to specialize in the sport that they love as long as they're under appropriate supervision. So I just thought that was an interesting point because they called out those sports in particular that it's okay for them to specialize but not so much um, for our other, our other athletes. <clears throat> So I do encourage you to check this, um, this study out on the Journal of Athletic Training. Um, again, looking at choosing a main sport for sports specialization, quitting other sports and focusing on that one and focusing all of their training at least eight months out of the year to be considered specialized in sports. All right, I love this. 
particular slide, this really resonates with me. Again, if you're in this patient population, you know what I mean here. As an athletic trainer in the high school setting, we are more than just evaluating their injuries. We are more than just taping and stretching and showing up to their games. We are a really pivotal adult figure in their life. Okay? They watch what we do, whether we know it or not or whether we like it or not. They watch how we react to adversity. They watch how we respond to challenges. They are watching. So this one just always resonates, and it just was important for me to share. And if you know, you know. Uh, an athletic trainer will impact more young people in a year than an average person will in an entire lifetime. I have athletes that I treated 10 years ago that we still talk. So I know many of you probably have very similar relationships with them. Just know your impact. All right, so let's get to what we're here to talk about. Let's talk about barriers. So we've got our background information under our belt. Why are our athletes still not reaching out if they know that we're here to support them and we have an open door policy? Why are our athletes still not seeking help? Well, we see several different barriers in the literature. One, past experiences. We might have had situations who, or situations where athletic or athletes, excuse me, have reached out to a professional and maybe that relationship didn't go over well. Maybe there was a violation in confidentiality. Maybe they didn't gel well with that, inf with that individual. And rather than saying, I'll just try again, maybe we just weren't the right fit. They just say, you know what, I'm done. I, I don't wanna get out of my comfort zone. I don't wanna do this again. Another barrier in the literature, one of the top in the list is stigma. Now stigma can either be perceived what I think, or it can be self-imposed, which is what I think, excuse me, and perceived either from my own thoughts or from external uh, variables like family. Okay, there could be a cultural component about seeking help. Mindset and personality also plays a really big role in whether or not an athlete will seek out assistance. Mental health literacy, which was really the focus of my research, as I dug through the literature, I found that mental health literacy was actually number one at the top of the list. Now, do we know what mental health literacy is? We're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but mental health literacy is actually one of the biggest barriers to whether or not our patient population is going to seek help for mental health um, illnesses. This is an ad, so new uh, research that just came out in the Journal of Athletic Training, like fresh, fresh came out in 2022, is we look at the social determinants of health and health disparities, okay? So if we know that our athletes might not have access to health care, maybe we as athletic trainers are their access, okay? We have to consider that and whether or not our athletes um, have access to that kind of health care. finicky today. There we go. Okay, so addressing uh, stigma. Both self-imposed and perceived stigma 100% exists. Even though on social media there's all these campaigns of, you know, stigma-free, break the stigma, it's okay not to be okay. Like, we're trying real hard to reach our population in, in many different ways, but unfortunately we still deal with that element of stigma. There's an emotional component of stepping out of one's comfort zone, of embarrassment, of what are people gonna think if I admit that I'm not feeling okay. Right? This fear or act of getting help has this potential of a sign of weakness. Okay? Picture in your mind maybe one of your, your tough athletes, you know, they're a leader on the team, and we don't know what's going on on the inside. And again, they might have this this delay or this, this apprehension about speaking up because they're afraid of what they're gonna per be perceived amongst teammates, amongst coaches, maybe even amongst parents, okay? I spent 11 years in a prep boarding school. I'm not sure if those are as prevalent out west as they are in, in New England, but we have a lot of preparatory and boarding schools, and there's a study that um, actually looks specifically at that population, and athletes are afraid because their parents put this high level of pressure of playing at the highest level. Well, what's gonna happen after you graduate? You go to D1, you're gonna play at the highest level and you're gonna get all these looks. Um, God forbid you speak up that you're not 100% well 
is that going to put a big red X on their back? So sometimes there's that parental influence. <clears throat> so how does personality type fit in? Well, we know it does. And in those of you who are like me, who love thinking about mindset and, and how different people approach challenges, we look at things like growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So our disposition mindset play a huge role in whether or not our athletes are going to step out and, and seek that help. Um, and optimistic individuals, the ones that are like, you know what, I'm going to roll with it. Maybe things didn't go the way that I had hoped to. Maybe I'm sidelined by an injury, but you know what, this is what I have in front of me. I'm going to manage it. I'm going to do what I need to do. It's not ideal, but I'm going to handle it and I'm going to move on. Okay? Those individuals tend to seek that extra help that they need because they see it as part of the process. Whereas we have those with maybe a little bit more of that fixed mindset, more of a perspective or pessimistic perspective, they're going to avoid that adversity. They don't want to do hard things. Right? They're going to harbor doubt. They're going to deal with that stress either by just disconnecting altogether, withdrawal from their team, withdrawal from their friend groups, or just distracting themselves by doing stuff. Okay, I can tell you I'm guilty of that. When you're, you're facing a challenge, you do everything that you can to avoid the challenge, and you pick up every little other activity that you have to try to delay. So I love the phrase of, I make life happen versus life happens to me. That is a wonderful way of categorizing our, our growth mindset versus our fixed mindset individuals. Okay, I'm in. All right, so mental health literacy is associated with the development of stigma. So this is why it's really important to look at mental health literacy because we think stigma, that's the number one barrier, right? People don't want to speak up. Well, mental health literacy actually precedes stigma, okay? Our athletes, particularly our high school athletes, do they actually know what mental health wellness is? Do they know what it means to be well in terms of their mental health? Do they know the signs and symptoms of things like depression or things like anxiety or bipolar disorder? Do they actually know what the signs and symptoms are? Because we throw it out pretty regularly. Oh, I'm so depressed. Or, oh, I feel so anxious, right? We use these words regularly, but are they actually aware of what the signs and symptoms are? Are they aware of what treatment is like? They might think of, okay, if I need to go to therapy, maybe they have this expectation of, in their mind, well, I sit in this room face to face with a stranger and I tell them all my life, my life story. So they have a perception. Okay. So school-aged athletes, they actually demonstrate a limited knowledge of mental health literacy. And so that's our number one pitfall is we have to boost up mental health literacy. And how do we do that? Okay. There are several different ways that we can boost mental health literacy, and it could be through our health programs in school. It could be through a class. It could be through modeling our behavior. It could be just talking about it, okay? There's so much power in having conversations about our own maybe mental health experiences or maybe talking about uh, more of it in our athletic training room because we know how much time our athletes spend in the athletic training room. So as athletic trainers, we have just this huge opportunity to be teachers. So there may be some of you who are dual teachers and athletic trainers, um, but just know that even if we're out of the classroom, we have this huge opportunity to educate our athletes in the athletic training room to boost that mental health literacy. So there's this awesome um, resource here from, again, 2022. This is fresh. Journal of Athletic Training, you have access to this if you are members. And we look at the prevalence of mental health, substance abuse, and barriers in the secondary school um, athletes. So we are seeing more research. So someone like me who started looking at this just a few years ago, to see more conversations happening, it's, it's just silent cheer. I'm super excited. Um, but just know that the resources are there, which we're going to talk about. Components of mental health literacy, understanding what it means to have good mental health, how to maintain mental health. We should be able to identify common mental health disorders and treatment. Mental health literacy also looks at minimizing the stigma. If we talk about it, people are going to be less likely to stigmatize it. Okay, If it's part of our normal conversation, it's not hush-hush. 
Okay. This is going to ultimately enhance our help seeking. So if we talk about it, we break down barriers, we talk about mental health literacy, ultimately it's going to naturally boost that help seeking behavior. So if we have knowledge, we're going to change our attitudes and our help seeking will naturally increase. So I'm not going to spend too much time in the next couple of slides because we have a few other things that are really, really important that I want to make sure that we cover. There are several scales available to assess mental health literacy. This is likely not something that we're going to do as athletic trainers, but there are several methods if this is a passion of yours and you're curious about it, if you want to talk with your school counselors um, or other health professionals that are in the mental health realm. So there is emerging literature, as you can see, just through February of 2022. So keep your eyes out. So those of you who are in this particular uh, patient population, more is coming, which is amazing. So there are intervention strategies. I really want to pinpoint this. So for professionals, mental health first aid is available. It is effective um, and it is widely available. Anyone ever go through this course, mental health first aid? All right, so a few of them. It is available. Check it out. Um, and again, it's super effective. It's been looked at and evaluated for its efficacy. So I'm gonna skip through uh, the first, but there are other programs that schools can implement in their health curriculum that are also effective. Simply just by having conversations as early as middle school, even in elementary school, obviously age appropriate, when we start to talk about maybe case studies. We give little stories about people who are going through maybe a mental health crisis, again, age appropriate. We start those conversations in third or fourth grade, middle school into high school. Wonderful way of increasing our mental health literacy. So what do we have for options? We identify our athletes that might be struggling. Okay. Who do they identify as their options? Social su support is huge. So it's going to be their family in most cases, friends, their coaches are going to be their lifeline. But athletic trainers, okay, people like you and me, are really high on that list. Other options of how we're going to handle these situations, sports psychology methods, mindfulness and goal setting, deep breathing and meditation. I'm going to tell you I was nervous today. Again, I haven't been in front of a group in a long time. I've done virtual, but humans, hi, humans. And so I pulled up my Insight Meditation app, get the jitters out, and I did six minutes of meditation. So we have to start considering some of those maybe outside of the box methods for some of us. We know that also referral to specialists is going to be another option. Okay, school climate is going to be another indicator. This is, again, not something that we're doing as athletic trainers, but there is literature in the secondary school that our school climate, talk to your administrators, okay? Talk to your school psychologists, your counselors. School climate can also play a really uh, huge factor in what is the actual temperature of the school. Okay. When that school culture, that climate, that environment, if it's kind of on the downslope, we're going to see maybe an uptick in mental health issues. And the question becomes whether or not are we going to see our athletes actually speaking up. Whereas if things are really good, okay, things are, are well, our students are performing, our programs are doing well, our athletic programs are doing well, we're going to see a lower incidence of, of our mental health um, significance. So again, integrate people who are involved, stakeholders. This is my huge plug as athletic trainers in the high school setting is to not be on your own island, okay? Whenever we wanna influence some sort of change or policy, we cannot do it alone. So we really need to make sure that we are staying well-versed with our administrators. Our administrators should know who we are. Our principals should know who we are. Coaches and our athletic directors obviously should know who we are. And integrate with your parents. If you have the opportunity at games to speak to parents and families and guardians, it is such a wonderful support to anything that you hope to implement as an athletic trainer. So clinical bottom line. What are we taking away from this? We're still working on building resources, but know that there are resources. They're coming next, okay? Stigma can be reduced by early intervention to help improve our mental health literacy, which we know is one of the number one barriers 
to help uh, health help seeking in our adolescent patients. So what uh, resources are available? We've got a few of them here. If you look on the, um, the NATA website or J Journal of Athletic Training, there are several resources that are available. We have consensus statements at the collegiate setting. We have uh, inner association uh, cons uh, consensus statements at the secondary school setting. We also have the mental health be best practices, excuse me, for the NCAA, and they progressively get longer. If you look at the secondary school consensus statement, I wanna say it's close to around 22 pages or so. Um, so they are lengthy, but they are a wonderful resource if you have not looked at them recently. So we're gonna breeze over this quickly for time. So as early as 2013 was our first consensus statement. We had in 2015 our second consensus statement that is relative to this group population that we're speaking of today. And we have our mental health best practices. So this is all fresh. Okay, in the last 10 years or so. Asking questions, what does our PPE look like? Let's start to talk about action items. What are you gonna take away from today's presentation? That's one of my favorite things. Whenever I'm in your place and I sit and I listen to someone talk about something, they're usually so well-versed and passionate and they have all these awesome things to share. But at the end of the day is what am I taking that I can implement on Monday? What can I do on Monday? So here we are kind of moving towards the end of our sports seasons. In the summer, we'll start to look at our PPE. We'll start to look at our EMR. We're gonna to start to look at how we're documenting. So this is the things that we want to write down as are we doing these things to best practice moving forward? So a lot of our EMR are starting to integrate mental health questions. So if you haven't reviewed your EMR lately, that's gonna be one of the things, top of your list going into the next school season is review your EMR, review your document, documentation strategies to, to see what kind of questions are being, are being asked of our athletes. And if they're missing altogether, this is a huge opportunity, okay? So let's take that as number one, look at the questions that we're asking and how can we do better? So the PHQ-9 I have listed at the bottom is kind of the gold standard. And when you go in for a physical as an adult, the PHQ-9 is usually what you're given um, as a patient when you go in for your physical. So that's kind of what we frame a lot of our questions when it comes to mental health and depression in particular. Um, there are several different scales. Um, so definitely take a peek at what you are using. All right, I love this slide, so I wanna catch up in my notes because I wanna make sure that I don't miss this here. All right. Has anyone seen this study? It's from 2015, it's a little bit older, but this talks about athletic trainers and our ability to look at a patient in front of us and can we identify these mental health concerns? 97% of the athletic trainers who participated in this study were like, yeah, I can do that. I can totally acknowledge when one of my patients come in, I know something's not right, I know something is wrong, and I need to intervene. Okay? But from this, the biggest uncertainty that athletic trainers in this study were presenting were, okay, well now what though? I can identify it, but what do I do? Now we all know, especially those in academia, we know that Katie gives us the tools in our athletic training education programs. We are versed in sports psychology um, interventions. Maybe it's not our comfort zone, but we are versed, we are taught as athletic training students. Um, our curriculum was revised in 99, it might have even been more recently, uh, to make sure that we implement sports psychology courses, mindfulness, goal setting, visualization. So that's one of the big things that we have a little bit of a gap for athletic trainers. We feel confident about identifying, but not as much on what do we do now. So we're gonna test that. How am I doing on time? All right, I wanna make sure that we leave time. So what is our comfort level? I'm gonna paraphrase this story. This is in that 2015 study. All of my slides are in the app, so you can definitely go in and look and reread this. Uh, but this young man is a soccer player at a higher level, Division I. He has a pretty high-grade ankle sprain. And this is a little vignette. This is how we learn um, in a lot of our mental health literacy interventions are these little vignettes, right, storytelling. 
So he shows up for his rehab, and as he works through his rehab, he's compliant, but he's kind of meh. He's not really engaged. His kid's usually pretty energetic. He starts to come late, and a little bit of our red flags in our mind start to go ding, ding, ding. What's going on with this young man? So our first discussion is, number one, what do we do with him? He has this injury. He comes to rehab, but he's showing up late. He's not as engaged with his team. You can see that he's kind of disassociating a little bit. What do we do with him? Okay. So discussion number one is, do we do nothing? Do we take no action? Hopefully that's, we can cross that off the list. Two, do we monitor him, but we don't really make a referral? We identify, let's keep an eye on this young man, but other than that, we don't really do anything. Number three, do we consult with a, su a supervisor? Not really sure, I'm uncomfortable, I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm gonna go to my maybe head athletic trainer or maybe I'll pull in a school psychologist. Or last strategy, do we refer this young man? Well, I think we can agree, think about it a little bit, but I think we can maybe nix the top. I think we can nix the bottom, okay? Don't think this is necessarily an immediate referral. So as athletic trainers, these are our standards through the KD that outlines what we as athletic trainers can do. Now, whether we are comfortable or not in implementing the strategies, that's a different story. So what do we do with this young man? We can look at self-talk, we can look at communication, we can look at setting goals. As we look through this laundry list, I can see several things that maybe we can implement with this young man okay, as our first intervention. So one of the things that sticks out to me is maybe setting goals. Let's talk to him. Let's get him back on board. Let's reel him back in. Okay, he's drifted a little bit. Let's bring him back in. Okay, how are things going? Where do you imagine yourself to be? Okay. Are you where you need to be right now? Is this where you kind of had an expectation? No? Then what do we need to do to get you back on track? Okay. Involving maybe some of his other teammates to reel him back in, getting him engaged in practices. And then if he's having an issue with being present, maybe we talk about some strategies about breathing, visualization, maybe you look at his rehab and maybe not physically moving his ankle or lower body or doing core work. He's envisioning those things in his brain maybe before he goes to sleep, envisioning him on the turf again, envisioning him with a soccer ball at his feet. Okay. So our second, um, our second vignette is Oscar, and Oscar has a similar injury. So we can certainly have similar injuries and way different responses to those injuries. So high-level athlete, third-degree ankle sprain, he's missing some time. He starts to not come to rehab anymore. Okay? If he comes to practice, he's not really talkative, he's not engaged, then he stops coming altogether. When he hangs out with some of his, his teammates, we're starting to notice some really concerning talk, okay? losing his purpose in life. Okay. In this particular story, he says, sometimes I wish I wasn't around. Well, now we should be a little bit more concerned. Okay. He's starting to drink. He's starting to use alcohol and other substances to numb or to, to distract from the bigger problem that's in front of him. So discussion number two, same strategies. Take no action. Hopefully we cross that off the list. Monitor closely. Make no referral. Consult with a supervisor. Make an immediate referral. Well, what do you think? What do we do with him? When we start to have those kinds of discussions about, I wouldn't want to even call it necessarily a suicidal ideation, but it could be his first discussion of wanting help. I might need help. We need to watch this young man. We need to have a discussion with this young man. So I see a lot of things on this list that we can implement with Oscar. But I do think maybe we need to pull in someone else, okay? We need to have some sort of follow-up. So knowing your resources is really important. This goes back to having those relationships with um, those other stakeholders. All right, coming to the end of this, so I appreciate all of your attention here. This is kind of like, this is what I'm here for. There are resources. Okay. So this came out, I don't remember when this came out exactly, but we have this awesome card that we can print out, we can put it in our athletic training facilities, and it helps us when we're working with our, our athletes through a variety of different types of crises. We have raised awareness, growing concerns, when do we need to take action? 
Okay, and this is on the member resources on the NATA website. Whoa, why'd you do that? All right, how do I pull that back? Oh, he's working on it. So the first time I'm implementing a big old QR code here. So <laughs> I love me a QR code, I couldn't resist. So this brings you right to where you need to be on the athletic training or, or the NATA website. This is gonna bring you to those resources. If this doesn't work from where you are, again, this is in the slides that are in the app. And it is gonna bring you to that resource. And it's also gonna bring you to the resource of a mental health EAP. So if you're like, I don't know where to get started. I know I have my EAP for afternoon activities, what I do if my athlete gets injured on the baseball field, who, what, where, why, and how. Do we have a mental health EAP in place? Okay. So although it's out of the scope of this particular discussion to talk about creating an EAP, we should know that if we don't have one in place or maybe it's kind of bare bones, Let's start to look at that when we are in our off season and how can we build that up? There's a wonderful resource, again, on the um, NATA website that can walk us through how to create that mental health EAP. Another resource that we should be aware of is if we're dealing with big feelings in our athletes, okay, maybe we have issues with death okay, in our patient population we need help too as athletic trainers. We can't carry that burden, okay? So knowing that our AT Cares Committee, I don't know if Patrick is here by chance, um, but we do have um, your District 7 rep, knowing that AT Cares is an option, and they will help you through a myriad of situations from really small work-related stress to the bigger stuff. So please know as athletic trainers, we too have resources and that is modeling really good behavior for our athletes by asking for help ourselves. We should be coming right to the end, big old QR code, there it is. All right, that's gonna bring you to the AT Cares. So just in case you're like, oh, I gotta catch this. Um, this is gonna bring you to the AT Cares group on the NATA website. Um, check it out. Know your resources. All right, so here are our resources, our take home messages, at least things that I hope that you can piecemeal out of today's presentation. Again, I really am so grateful to be here talking about something that I'm so passionate about that I think athletic trainers just need to know how impactful that we can be on our patient population. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for being open to having um, somebody all the way from District 1 come and talk to you about this. And then again, I hope you can take home you know, the things of mental health EAPs. Let's take a look at them. Let's make them more robust. Let's look at our influence in the athletic training room and how we can be role models. Um, and then again, just looking at our policies and procedures, looking at our PPEs, and just making them to serve us best because our histories, our conversations with athletes, those really could be super impactful on how we, how we implement care in our population. So again, thank you. I appreciate you all. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you. If you have any, if you have any questions, go ahead and please line up at the microphones. There are no questions today. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Can you address issues that we may have with FERPA and HIPAA as we're dealing with this type of issue? Sure. I can speak to what I know and what I'm comfortable with. Um, you know, in terms of privacy, obviously, as healthcare professionals, that is the, of the utmost importance. Um, but we are also mandated reporters as athletic trainers. So if we are coming into a situation where an athlete is unsafe, looking at that type of situation, you know, we are mandated reporters. We do need to bring in um, people who are going to keep this athlete safe. So to speak to that point, if we are in a situation we are concerned about uh, suicidal ideations, hurting themselves or others, um, we do have that. That, um, that responsibility to report. If we are working with athletes who are working through depression, anxiety, maybe we have um, support systems in place. Um, I think, you know, in terms of, of 
involving stakeholders like coaches, uh, maybe that's where uh, maybe you're thinking with coaches and families. In our case, they are minors, so we need to make sure that we're, in, we're involving families. Um, but when we're involving coaches, I think we just need to be mindful about what information can be shared that keeps their confidentiality and their treatment safe, um, but also serving them to the best of the, their, the ability of the coaches. Um, kind of vague, unfortunately, um, but I think we have to just know that we are mandated reporters. We do need to involve um, other professionals when it is relevant. And then, you know, I think it's also just important that if it is not a mandated reporter situation, that we're picking and choosing things that we're sharing with the consent of that athlete. You know, I'd really like to talk to your coach about how we can best support you. We need to be team players. We need to be all on the same team rather than operating on our own island. So we just need to be mindful of those things um, when we're talking with other adults who could be potentially impactful on that athlete's care. Hearing them. <laughs> All right. Oh, go ahead, Bart. Yes. <laughs> I was super fortunate to finally meet Brett in person. Uh, Bart in person. Excuse me. I've obviously read all of, of Bart's work because he is a oh, huge. I'm sorry. What <laughs> no, this is nice. This is like fangirling a little bit because we never met in person, but I appreciate all the work that you do in mental health. I'll try to answer your question. Be kind. Thank you, I guess. <laughs> um, so I, I have a question about sharing with parents because many times parents are contributors or the cause of the mental mm, issues. Yeah. Yep. So at what point does the patient confidentiality overrule the need to inform parents? That's a great question, um, Bart. I'm not sure if I have 100% have the knowledge to answer that question because I think it's situational. I think in many cases we have to work within our scope and you know, when we're working in a mental health treatment situation, I'd like to think that I'm not managing 100% on my own. So in terms of families and if they're contributors, I think we need to be cognizant of our resources with school counselors and pulling them in as, as a potential resource as I'm dealing with this particular student. Um, we share confidentiality, you and I, so we can talk about this particular treatment of this athlete. What is gonna be the best method? Um, so I think our scope of practice will also come into play because if that athlete is now under treatment, if they're now seeing someone, um, and they're beyond our care, I think that's gonna dictate also what can and cannot be shared. So I'm sharing what I know and what I feel comfortable sharing because I don't wanna make an assumption and share something that I'm not 100% sure about, um, but I would be more than happy to kind of look into that, you know, in terms of confidentiality and talking with some other resources on how we can play play that card with parents because you're, you're correct that sometimes families can play a really big part or contributor to those situations. Yeah, sure. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just tying off of that, as far as when you are reporting to the parents and say they are the cause or providing, you know, undue stress to the patient, what is the follow-through for the athletic trainer at the secondary setting? I know in college with adults, we have more say mm -hmm. for like return to play and meeting criteria, but for a minor, if the parent doesn't want them to seek help or mm -hmm. follow through, what do you as the athletic trainer do at your setting to make sure that they're safe? We play a really important role, I think, in triage. And we're that middleman in, in physical injuries, I mean, I think about it like this. If I call an ambulance, if I have an athlete with a catastrophic injury and I call in an ambulance and they're there and we transfer care, my role as an athletic trainer for that athlete who's now on a spine board or who's being loaded into an ambulance, my job's not done. You know, my job is still to reassure that athlete. My job is I'm still gonna see that athlete every day and when they come back to school or they get cleared to come back i'm still a really important role in that athlete's life and in their return to play so i think 
a lot of that transfers to a mental health issue because we might transfer care to a therapist or a counselor or a psychologist. We might be transferring care, but our job's still not done. And we may or may not have access, depending on what the athlete allows in terms of our access to um, you know, treatment. We might not have all the information, but we're still gonna see that athlete every day. So we still have that responsibility to interact. How can I support you? They need to know that you are still there. And I think that's in this particular setting where we have minors and referrals, they just need to know where we stand as a resource and as a person that is a constant for them because we have athletes with a variety of different home lives, okay? Um, so in many cases, we all have those athletes who rely on you. You are a, a very prominent athlete or a very prominent adult in their life and they might be sharing more with you than they might with their families. So I think just knowing that your job doesn't end and you can certainly be there and apply the resources that you're trained to do, talking about goal setting and deep breathing and, and things like that. You can implement what you know and what's within your scope of practice and then again, just making sure that they're aware of, of your support that, that doesn't change. Yeah, of course. Thank you for all these questions. I don't necessarily have a question, but like, just okay. a comment. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, it's so emotional. That's okay. This is an emotional thing. It's an emotional topic, so please take your time. For a parent that has a student, I don't work at the school, mm -hmm. and has a son that has to deal with this, just know that having them refer to someone else is huge help but also having the confidence for them to come home and tell you the same things. And he doesn't share a lot with me. So just know that if, if you got to lean on somebody else to go with things and just being there for your kids is probably the biggest thing. Yes. So. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I just want to take a moment to kind of like let that sink in that as athletic trainers, again, I've said it before and I've said it again, and, and I've had families say, they tell you more than they'll ever tell me. And just know that we have this really big opportunity in front of us to be a support system and know that um, we need to just keep having this conversation, okay? Make these conversations normal. And it's not something different if I wanna bring up other situations that are not an ankle or a knee or a shoulder. Um, we need to just make sure that our athletes know that we are here and we're always listening. So thank you. We have time for one more question. Amazing. Well, I'll stick around for a little bit, but thank you again. I appreciate um, all of your attention. Have a wonderful rest of your conference. Thank you for the sunshine. This is a good thing. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer.